The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie McGee with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's presentation, Using Administrative Data to Strengthen APS Programs, being presented by Kenneth Steinman and Heidi Turner-Stone. Next slide, please. Before we get started, a couple of slides I wanna go through. The Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide, please. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, we work with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on the use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us on using the, using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. The APS TARC works with the National Adult Protective Services Association, or NAPSA, to present monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, and managers and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other about the issues and concerns facing APS programs today. The calls are held the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of each month, depending on which peer group you would want to attend. Registration information is sent via the APS listserv each month. Please email us if you are not a listserv member and, we, and would like to receive the registration information. Next slide. A copy of today's slides will be made available at a, at a later date. You may use computer audio or your phones to access audio for this webinar. We ask that you please mute your phones, headsets, or computer mics unless you are speaking so that we can eliminate any background noise. If you experience audio problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar and re-enter. Next slide, please. This is intended to be an interactive webinar and there will be opportunities for questions and comments during the presentation. However, if you prefer to submit your questions or comments in writing, you may type them in the questions box at any time during the presentation. Your questions will be relayed to our speakers. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the web at a later date, along with the handouts. We will notify all attendees via email when it has been posted online. Everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. Next slide, please. As noted earlier, our speakers are today are Dr. Kenny Steinman from The Ohio State University and Heidi Turner-Stone from The Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. I am now going to turn this over to Kenny and allow him and Heidi to introduce themselves. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, can you everyone hear me okay? We hear you very well, thank you. Thank you, okay. Um, one other thing, and Leslie, feel, feel free to um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we discussed earlier about because it's a relatively small group, whether it would be okay for people to turn on and just interrupt me if they have questions during the uh, the presentation. I may end up ex ex exercising my presenter prerogative and saying, let's hold that question till later, but is that still okay with you? That's fine, whatever works for you. Okay, so for the attendees who've logged on, um, as we're getting started, and please don't hesitate to um, to interrupt me, but I may end up saying let's hold off on uh, on the questions till a later time. So my name is Kenny Steinman. I'm a senior research scientist at the Ohio State University. I am relatively new to adult protective services. For the last 10 years, I've become increasingly interested in the epidemiology of family violence in general. And as I've learned more about that, specifically within the state of Ohio, I became more and more attracted to elder maltreatment and to adult protective services, seeing these as very important systems with uh, growing opportunities to address the problem, but also perhaps the, the scope of the problem may be also increasing. So I saw this as a one, and I've been very impressed with the culture and the abilities of the people who work in this area. And so at this point in my career, um, I was very excited to become part of this. Uh, I have served on the faculty of the College of Public Health at Ohio State for 11 years and then have served in other research capacities since then. So I am, uh, like to think of myself as energetic and capable, but also but willing to learn and willing to work with people, including the like folks on this call who can teach me 
about what actually happens in practice, but also I can, who might be receptive to some of the uh, research that, uh, that excites me and that I might be able to contribute. So let me stop there and uh, turn it over to Heidi, who can uh, introduce herself. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad you could join us. Uh, my name is Heidi Turner Stone, and I'm the Section Chief for Adult Protective Services at the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. We are a state supervised, county administered state. So, as some of you know, that means that the counties do all of the hard work up front with the client and we get to tell them what to do. No, I'm just kidding. Basically, we try to work with our counties to provide them with as much support and uh, technical assistance as they need, and um, really there to help them do the great work that they do with the clients that they serve. Um, working with OSU on this particular research project has been very exciting for us. It's one of the first times that I have had the opportunity to work on a project such as this. And it was a very welcome experience in that Ohio is one of those states that has a relatively new data system. So this was an opportunity for us to give it a, a, a uh, workout, as well as putting new emphasis on what is happening in adult protective services, not just in Ohio, but across the nation. So we're really excited about that. And I am excited for you to hear some of the things that Dr. Steinman and his team learned. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Heidi. So Leslie and WRMA asked that we uh, identify some learning objectives for the session, and I wanted to clarify, and I take these seriously as someone who has <laughs> taught a lot in the classroom. Um, one is to that, well, we will, by the end of this session, you should be able to list at least two benefits of using APS administrative data, um, and also to identify at least two practices of both organizing APS data and of analyzing APS data. And you don't have to be a researcher to engage with these, but I, I want to hopefully complicate the situation for you, but then also provide some paths forward to show how it, um, the opportunities available for why APS administrative data might be actually very useful for us. So in terms of the organization of the, of the uh, presentation itself, we'll talk briefly about why APS administrative data, why should we use it, and then best practices for both organizing and analyzing it. And then we'll, um, Heidi and myself will talk um, at some length about um, the, the project that we did in Ohio as one example, hopefully, of some of these best practices actually being used in, in, a, in a project, in an ongoing project. So why? APS administrative data. Well, for many people on this call, we're familiar that many different systems have administrative data. It might be criminal justice or healthcare systems or child welfare for that matter, and APS is no exception. There is um, some uh, literature, some studies and publications and guidance for in general, how does one analyze and use administrative data but as my colleagues and I were working on this particular project, we soon learned there was nothing written that we had ever seen specific to APS. And I called up and <laughs> engaged some other people to say, hey, what is out there written about how, how does one analyze APS administrative data? And some people had some experiences doing it, but there was actually nothing in writing. And so this is something that I'm actually working on with some colleagues from around the country now, but this project gave us an, uh, a, um, an opportunity to really begin to think this, these issues through. So why APS administrative data? Well, as, you, as I mentioned before, other systems, might be healthcare, might be criminal justice, do have something to do with adult maltreatment, but APS is the only system that's primarily devoted to addressing and documenting adult maltreatment. Also, unlike many research studies, um, there are typically many, many observations. We might do a study where we're looking at financial exploitation and screening tools in a certain population, and we give out a survey to a bunch of people, and maybe we have a couple dozen people, maybe even 100, 200, and that can be useful. But that um, administrative data, we're typically talking about thousands or even tens of thousands of cases. And just the volume of that information opens up opportunities for us to really think differently and ask different types of questions that we might otherwise from, from smaller samples. 
Also, one major advantage of using APS administrative data is that researchers like me can come in and do it with little or even no burden on clients and their staff. At times when, let's say, a care, you know, caregivers or, or, or their vulnerable adults might be vul particularly vulnerable and, um, and the staff is dealing with them or overwhelmed with so many different responsibilities, at some level, the last thing they need is a researcher coming in asking them to fill out a survey or participate in an interview, et cetera. And so while administrative data are by no means the only important way of looking at APS, they do provide one of the real advantages of them is that we can perhaps generate some useful insights without burdening clients and staff. Also, APS data are increasingly available. And the map that you see here, I just highlighted a couple states where I, in the research literature, had seen um, studies published using different states' um, APS data, administrative data in particular. This is a bit of a, exaggeration is the wrong word, but a optimistic view because with the exception of a few states, many of these states, there's only like one study that came from them. And I think one, and even a single study, I think had data from New Hampshire, Tennessee, and Oregon. So all of those three states are only listed there because of one study. Um, others, a couple states, California, Texas, Illinois, um, being important examples, have, have had a, a bunch of studies published using their APS data. Um, and there's some excellent work that's being done recently out of Maine. We'll talk about an example from that in a little work in a little bit. But in general, you'll see Ohio is not highlighted. We, as far as I can tell, and Heidi, correct me if I'm wrong, or Leslie, Andy, others on the call, um, there's no published data that have used APS administrative data to look at APS um, in Ohio. So, we, so there, are, and yet there's thanks to the support of ACL and increasing interest in st different state agencies, there is more and more data to use. It's just that we're still, as Heidi mentioned before, it's still a relatively new process, and these systems are relatively new. So, in terms of, um, as you might imagine, there are also some disadvantages or cautions that we need to consider when we're thinking about how to use APS administrative data for, for research. And first of these is that these systems were not designed for research. They're designed for case management. And that's appropriate, and that should be the, the primary use of it. Um, it's not that they can't be used for research, but for researchers like myself, we need to go into this recognizing that the um, that these are not necessarily set up and might not necessarily be able to be changed in ways that are going to be perfect for research. Their first and primary goal should be for case management. And my and so I want to acknowledge that we can use these for research, but let's be let's recognize that that may there may be some limitations in doing so. Um, in terms of, um, I mentioned the newness before, this also means that there's some sort of uncertain validity or reliability. We're not quite sure exactly what it is we think we're measuring. So we can say a, a report has been substantiated or validated, but what does that exactly mean? And we might have, um, or a report's been screened in. Now we might have a, you know, there might be guidelines that and policies that help describe that on paper, but in reality, is each program recording that in the same way? Do they each have their own, the similar practices they use for making those determinations? Maybe yes, maybe no, it's uncertain. Understandably, when researchers like me come in, some of the staff in the agencies are understandably leery. I'm coming in and I'm gonna make some big pronouncements and draw conclusions and have research findings based on these data. Yet they, the staff may know, well, I fill out these data and we're not, we always don't do the perfect job doing it. So um, staff may be understandably leery about drawing conclusions from these data. So I think it's important for researchers like myself to work collaboratively with agency staff like Heidi and others to share that recognition of the uncertainty and to work together to figure out what it is we can reliably say and what it is we really can't. Um, the last um, uh, con concern, consideration before going into this is that we're often unsure what to ask. Um, Heidi will talk later in our experience in Ohio about what were some of the questions that she hoped to initially address going into this project. And we found that some of them we couldn't answer in the way that we hoped we would be able to until we actually started looking at the data. 
So, and we're not quite sure exactly what it is we want to ask. There's an example I use um, that's a, a former colleague, actually my boss, a former dean of the College of Public Health had used before, of a um, guy's flying by across the treetops in a hot air balloon. And he's in a balloon race and he's trying to get to the finish line. And so he, uh, uh, but it's not sure where it is. And so he, yell, he sees someone on the ground, he yells down, oh, excuse me, can you tell me where I am? And she's there and she gets out her different tools and, and quickly yells back at him, you're 91.86 miles north, northeast of Boston. And he said, oh, do you happen to be a researcher? And she says, why, yes, how did you know? He says, well, you answered my question, but it's of no use to me whatsoever. And so she replies to him, oh, well, are you a policymaker? Are you a practitioner? And he said, well, why, yes, how did you, how do you know? He said, well, she says, well, because I answered the question you asked me, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going, and now you're blaming me for your problems. So this is, <laughs> some, some reflects at some level some of the, the challenge that we as researchers and practitioners face when we're working together. It's, it's hard to be, be able to tell that sort of, what I hope is an amusing anecdote and see absolutely no faces whatsoever. So. Um, maybe an emoji later, you can tell me if that was that, that went over well or not. So rather than ask, uh, answer questions, because these data are new, because we're not sure what exactly we're measuring, let's use administrative data to ask better questions. So we'll go into this trying to think, trying to frame better questions rather than conclude that program X is better than program Y or that the substantiation rate is going up or going down. Um, so, or that here's the caseload um, and that's associated with certain types of APS outcomes. We might not be ready to do that yet. And so we should look at, and we're, as we're looking at APS administrative data at this point in time for most of the systems that we're talking about, let's focus on using APS data to ask better questions. Oops. So um, now in terms of um, organizing, APS administrative data. Um, but, so that was sort of the uh, about why APS data. Now to talk about organizing administrative data, there are many things we could get into with this. I don't want this to become a method section or a textbook, but I wanted to just highlight two issues that I've frequently seen people kind of skipping over or not sure what to do with, and yet I think are very important. One is involves cleaning data. And the other one involves what time window do you choose when looking at data? So cleaning data, in terms of the data, um, you might see that there are different, as you could imagine, APS administrative data, like almost any large data system, has errors. I think somebody referred, one of Heidi staff referred to them as a fat finger error. We're sort of just accidentally hit the wrong key as we're punching in different numbers. And so that, that might, you might have a birth date of February 19th, 2057, which is obviously not possible. Um, we also sometimes encounter systematic errors. So for instance, a, um, one of the fields you might have in the data system is whether the client has some sort of known um, uh, or a, a substance abuse problem or, or, or substance abuse disorder is known to be associated with the client. And it may be that if uh, the, all of the, um, the answers to that are either yes or no. And, and so all of, there's no missing data. Everything's either coded yes or no. Whereas in fact, the no's may actually include both unknown as well as no. And so to automatically code some data as no could be systematically changing and perhaps biasing the, the results. And related to that are missing data. Um, a lots and lots, many of the fields are missing data. I, I think with Heidi, hopefully it won't be a shock, but um, I'm, I'll give the example of race and ethnicity. Well over half of the data on race and ethnicity uh, was missing. And so is it fair, to us to draw fair for us to draw conclusions based on those data that are there? How do we decide when or whether to present um, data that, where there's lots of missing data? How much data is too much? How much missing data is too much? All of these types of issues lead to two concerns. One is noise and the other is uh, bias. 
Now noise, uh, the icon you see in the upper right part of the screen um, may, is not an iPod, but for those of us of a certain age, it's a radio. And a helpful metaphor is we used to, you know, turn the dial a little bit to get the signal. And as you might have experienced, sometimes they're static and you can't quite get the signal. All of these types of errors can lead to what we can call colloquially noise. There's something really happening in the data. There are trends there that are important that we could identify, but all of these errors are making it harder for us to detect that true signal. Bias, on the other hand, is something where there might not be actually something going on, but the data make it look like there's a certain trend that isn't really there. It's just that the, um, the errors are systematically leaning us, leading us towards one conclusion and that we need to be guarded in terms of thinking about how, for instance, um, certain types of cases might be more likely to have missing data than other types of cases. And if we don't account for that, then we might end up getting a uh, misleading result. So there was actually an op-ed in the New York Times last, uh, last month, I think in May. And there, I don't know if people can click on the link. If you get the slides, I think I embedded the link to that by Dan Kahneman and uh, Cass Sunstein and uh, um, someone else. I think Dan is a Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist. And, um, and they talked about both of these issues, bias and noise as problems in a broader sense, well beyond APS. It's well done. They also have a book on this topic coming out, which I have ordered, but not yet read. So um, the other issue I mentioned, cleaning data. I also wanted to talk about choosing a time window. For the Ohio study, we, you know, talking with Heidi, that the ODAPs, I think, had been um, fully operational in all of the Ohio's local programs since April of 2019. Is that right, Heidi? I'm sorry, I didn't hear quite what you said. I'm sorry, I was saying, I was just, I was, I was tired of hearing myself talk. I wanted to hear someone else talk for a second. Um, for, um, <laughs> The o ODAPS, the Ohio's APS system, when we first started working on it, the all of the counties had finally come on board by April of 2019. Yeah. And so yeah. we could have potentially looked at that, but we purposefully said, you know, some of these systems or counties are gonna, let's give them a couple months to get up and running. And so we looked, we chose a 12 month window during the state's fiscal year that began July 1st, 2019, and went through June 30th, 2020. And that was sort of the snapshot that we looked at. Now, Ohio is a large state, and so we had tens of thousands of cases to look at, and that seemed reasonable and sufficient. Um, we also wanted to look at several, um, you know, many, a full year rather than just a couple months. Um, another study from Maine came out. Maine's a much smaller state. And they had just recently published a study looking at, I think, at financial substantiated cases of financial exploitation and how that was associated with Medicare spending, um, might have been Medicaid actually. And so they, but because Maine, Maine's a smaller state, because they were only looking at substantiated cases of financial exploitation, they had far fewer to work with. So they ended up gathering data from four years. Now they, their system has been in operation longer than Ohio's, and so they were able to do that. But there's some you know, issues with doing so. If we look, if we, our time window is too short, we might miss seasonal variation. And I'd love to hear from any attendees here, either in the chat, or you can interrupt if you'd like, about whether in your states you see much seasonal variation in APS reports. I know in Ohio, we do, and we've been able to document that. Um, it's also, however, as in the case of Maine, potentially, if you choose a longer time window, especially over a couple of years, you need to account for what we, what we statisticians call model, um, temporal change over time. The fact that, you know, the number of reports coming in might be increasing over time, or the substantiation rates might be changing, or that its association with Medicaid expenditures might be changing, or the types of people who are being referred to APS might be changing. All these things tend to change over time. And if we don't account for those temporal changes, then we could end up with misleading results. So I, I don't know, Leslie, if, if in the chat, anyone had responded to this, uh, this question about whether other states have also seen seasonal variation in the number of APS reports they see. 
Not yet. No one responded to that. Okay. So, well, let me, let me stop there and say and ask if there are any questions um, or comments for that matter. Feel free to either, if you're able to um, use your microphone, please do that, or please submit any questions or comments to the chat. And then Leslie, I can't see them, but Leslie can read right. them to me. We do actually have a question. It wasn't a response to the one you asked, but we mm -hmm. have another question. Not sure if it's in within the scope of presenter expertise, but would appreciate any ideas for measuring impact of training offered to law enforcement and legal professionals. Also, is anyone aware of a source to track changes in prosecution of abuse cases? And I'll read it again just because there was a lot there. Not sure if within the scope of the pres presenter expertise, but would appreciate any ideas for measuring impact of training offered to law enforcement and legal professionals. Also, would anyone is anyone aware of a source to track changes in prosecution of abuse cases? Yes. I can start off by talking and others, I'm sure maybe someone else has, who has comments, feel free to respond to the chat. Um, two quick, an or two not so quick answers to that. One is that um, in Los Angeles County, there is an elder abuse forensic center. And one of the, um, studies that looked, they looked very systematically at whether the presence of this, um, this forensic center had changed certain outcomes. And one of the things they did is, I think initially it was what's called a randomized controlled trial, where they would randomly assign um, certain cases that when, once this center first opened, some of them, some of those cases were referred to the center and they got this new approach that was integrated and brought together many different types of systems. Um, and the others got sort of the treatment as usual, what had usually been done. And one of the outcomes that they found was that they had increased the number of, um, of referrals to the prosecutor's office that the prosecutor's office took and, and uh, followed up on and charged and so form, filed a formal complaint in a formal criminal, criminal case. So that's one example from one county where I know that's been done. Um, one of the challenges in doing this is that um, my guess is, and, uh, and then I'll be quiet and I'd love to hear from others, is that um, adult protective services, most of the systems that I've been familiar with from different states, don't necessarily track what happens. They might say we referred this to you know, the prosecutor's office, but they don't know then what happens. And that's not recorded in the data system. So what you would need to do is actually take data from the criminal justice system and link it to adult protective services and say, okay, we know that the client, here's the name, the birth date, where it was, and then we know, if we can, can we match that to certain um, arrest data and other prosecution data that might be available from a different agency? So that's probably what doing that type of work would involve, and I don't know off the top of my head of anyone who's done it. So let me stop there and, and ask Leslie or whoever else is facilitating if there are other answers to that question, which is a great question. I think you covered it um, and you got an appreciation for the ideas. So thank you. Oh, but that was that, the only that question. Emoji, is it? I'm sorry. Is that an emoji? No, actually, she said appreciate the ideas. So. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, old school, actually using text. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And I will, I will say that my, uh, once these short slides are available, you can Google my name. I'm e relatively easy to find, but I'm really, really eager and interested in finding out what's happening in other states. And I'll just say, and for free, kind of just talking through some of these issues with you. If, if this ever comes up, I'm, I think this is a new area. It's exciting. And so I'd really love to find out what's happening in other states. I'm connected with other researchers and thanks to um, folks I'm working with on this project through NAPSA and the research to practice partnership on starting to make those other connections. But please, please, please do not hesitate to contact me directly um, with any questions. If you say, hey, can we just talk about my data and what I wanna do with it? And uh, I'm happy to consider and talk in that regard. And so, and I can't speak for Heidi, but <laughs> maybe she can also talk about her perspective as well. So, um, okay, any other questions, Leslie, or should we continue? No, we can keep going. Great, okay. 
So um, moving along, so analyzing, oops, APS administrative data. So we talked about organizing it and in terms of analyzing it, I want to, again, there are many, many issues we could potentially talk about here. And two of which I think are particularly important are, and I tried to make this alliterative, <laughs> is to diligently define metrics and to carefully compare programs. So I'd like to talk about each of those. What do we mean by metrics and carefully compare programs? So, and here's where I'm gonna turn it over to Andy, Kate Part, who is going to facilitate a poll. And the question that will come up from this poll is just, and there's, again, no right or wrong answer, but I'm curious to think for the people in this call, whether you think that about the, the metric, the number of APS reports per 1,000 eligible adults. Do you think it's better to have a higher rate or a lower rate, or do you think it depends? So for instance, if you were comparing two programs that were serving similar communities, and one had a higher rate of APS reports, and the other one had a let's say, markedly lower rate, which would you say, which rate is better? So let me stop there and Andy um, can, and you can participate in the, the poll and then uh, we'll see the results and move from that. So please just go ahead and click on the appropriate response or what you believe to be the, the right answer on your screen and we will um, give the results for this in just a few seconds. Give you about five seconds, Andy. Okay, let's see the results. So about 38% of you uh, believe that it's, uh, sorry, my screen is hidden here. Better to have higher numbers for 1,000 eligible adults and 63% said it depends. So that's our most prevalent answer there, Kenny, our biggest response. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, I'm, can you say that again? About 38% said higher and- Right, and no one said lower. No the one rest, said sixty-three percent said it depends. Depend. Good. Okay. Excellent. So all, all I wanted was some disagreement, which we got. <laughs> um, this is great. It's it's hard to say. I mean, I I kind of say like it depends, but even then, like it, at the end of the day, if we're going to use APS data, eventually we'll probably have to decide whether a higher or lower rate is quote unquote better. It very well may depend, and it may depend. May we say we can't say that in general, but in, for these types of cases and this type of situation, maybe we, we are prepared to say a higher rate is better. So let me unpack this a little bit and talk about how what seems to be a pretty straightforward metric, just how many reports are you getting in per, let's say, a thousand eligible adults, how difficult it can be to actually measure this and how to define it diligently. Um, I want to, oops, sorry, say that. Um, it's important that at this stage, I really tried to remember, remind this, and Heidi was very good at holding us to account in this, that we're not saying these metrics are equivalent to success. We're just trying to understand, do we think they're measuring something worthwhile? Are they providing us with some sort of insight? We're not ready to say this is better or worse, or high, it, it, um, but that we want to understand why there might be some variation in it. If the, the data, the metrics are wholly unreliable and have no real bearing on reality or there's too much missing data, you know what, we'll just ignore them for now and maybe try to work together to collect more accurate data if we think that's really important. But, um, but what we want to do is as we're thinking about defining these metrics, let's think through what are the assumptions we're making about where these data are coming from and also how easy is it to interpret? You know, we can have some very fancy pants researchers coming in and talking about very sophisticated ways of measuring things, but if they're not interpretable to people on the front lines to the, and to the policymakers who are making decisions, it, be, it, it can become difficult to communicate that and to engage folks in, in a process of interpreting the results. And so we, all, we want these, whatever metrics we define to also be interpretable and have some sort of relevance to policy. If it's higher or lower, it doesn't really matter unless there's something we might want, think we can do to change it. So something is what seems to be as simple as a reporting rate actually could be defined a whole bunch of different ways. Do we want to talk about the number of referrals or the number of unduplicated clients? Do we want to look only at screened in cases or maybe we want to include those that are even screened out initially? Do we want to look only at those cases that are substantiated or, or those that you know were 
not not substantiated or validated, I think is the terminology we use in Ohio. And that's just for the numerator. For the denominator, well, who are these 1,000 eligible adults? Most states, and Ohio is an exception here, most states say anyone over 18 is eligible. However, in most states, even those that are ser serve people and any adult 18 or over, the majority of their cases come from older adults. Those are often over 60. And so, well, do we have everyone that might end up warping the results, as I'll show in, a, in an example in a little bit. Um, also, many states limit the um, the eligible that a an adult must be vulnerable or impaired in some way, um, or disabled in some way, to be the different language in different states in order to be eligible. And that how are we supposed to use, let's say, census data to come up with the denominator for calculating a rate? So just from these, these few examples here, we might have six ways just from this slide of defining what a reporting rate is. And they might result in different kinds of findings. So it becomes, and again, I'm not saying one of these is the right way, but rather we need to think through these assumptions and identify what are the ways to approach this. So when we get back to this question, you know, what kind of rate is better? It's, oh, we're not there yet our goal might be eventually to get there and to figure out what, depending on how we diligently define this metric, and the same thing goes for a substantiation rate or the percent of cases that are opened within you know, three days of the initial referral. Um, we'll probably want to eventually get there, but let's get there together with practitioners and researchers working together to say, yeah, here's what we think is being measured accurately. And for this subset of situations, we think that this is something we want to work towards. So as I said, we're not, and we're not passing judgment yet. Eventually, in a couple of years, maybe we will. But for right now, I really encourage folks to use APS administrative data to ask better questions. And you'll, you'll notice, by the way, that the, uh, the fellow who was in the balloon has now landed. He's fired the researcher who gave him a sassy answer and hired someone else. And the new researcher seems to be much more on board with uh, using data in this way. So for instance, the, some questions that we could ask that are better is why do substantiation rates appear to vary from program to program or in Ohio from county to county? Among APS programs, let's say in the subset of small rural counties, why do those operating from senior service agencies tend to have higher reporting rates? I don't know, we're not saying that it's better or worse, but rather let's look at this together and talk about whether this is something that we want to investigate further. Or why is the reported percent of cases that are opened within two days of the initial referral much lower than average in this APS program versus others? So it might be, again, we're not trying to evaluate a program per se, but it's a fair question perhaps to raise to folks um, at the local level and try to understand maybe is it that you're reporting data differently? Maybe that you're struggling to be able to open cases in this way or um, what might be an answer to that? So, Trying to ask better questions is what I think should the focus be for using APS data at this point. In terms of, um, so that was about, um, about you know, diligently defining metrics. I also want to, um, how can we carefully compare APS programs? And part of this involves thinking through, you know, we use the metaphor of apples to apples, but there are different kinds of apples. And so, which programs are similar enough to compare? Where well, we're not comparing apples to oranges, but we're comparing a Honeycrisp to a Fuji. So we say that there's enough similarity here for us to work, work, uh, that's worthwhile. In Ohio, for instance, we have, uh, let's say Cuyahoga County, where Cleveland is located, large urban county. And they have a ro robust, very well established APS program. What can the small rural county in Appalachia learn from them? To what extent should we compare those two programs and to find out which is quote unquote performing better or why there's different? At some level, you could argue, you know what, they're just not similar enough. We don't, yes, there are things they can certainly learn from one another, but that maybe that's not the reference, the context in which we wanna put these results. The other issue that I'd like us to consider, and this is something I've seen um, neglected, I think a lot in the, 
in studies and in the, even in the quality assurance literature that I've seen around APS is when we're comparing programs, we need to account for community differences like population size or urban, urban rural, and also for client differences. And let me give an example of each of these. Now, these, this is real data. I, I've renamed the counties, but these are real data from two counties in Ohio that have nearly identical populations. So there's their bars sort of represent their population. And one has 100, had 180 APS reports and the other one had 129 during the year we looked at it. Okay, so that, now that's a, you know, a significant, that's probably a 40% difference. It's a you know, pretty large difference in terms of their number of cases. However, the population distribution of these counties is quite different. If you look in Pine County, for instance, nearly half of the adult population is 60 years or older. In Beehive County, it's closer to about a quarter, a little over a quarter. So there's a very large um, difference. And the, again, these are real data. The, actually, the APS data I, I made up, but all of the population data are, are the same. And it's, if I looked longer, I could probably find an exact example, but you'll, you'll get the idea. So let's say that, so given these two different age distributions in the county, even if let's say the number of younger adults, 18 to 59, two and 1,000 from each of these counties were say referred to APS in, in a given year, and in each of those counties, 10 and 1,000, identical rates for each age group were referred to APS, that would result in what the data we see. So if we just look at the, the, the overall data without accounting for the distrib different population distribution and age in, across these two counties, we conclude that, well, Pine County has a busier APS program. They have a higher rate is 38% of our, um, a higher reporting rate is 38% of our participants thought would be better. Um, however, if we account for age, they're basically identical. And so, and so the question, and not that one is better or not, but the question is, well, what, what are we actually asking? Is it we just want to know that how busy each of these programs are, in which case we know, okay, Pine County is busier, but then we should expect counties that have an older um, population to have busier APS programs because they tend to serve older adults in general. If, however, we were interested in promoting awareness of APS and we wanted to increase the number of um, you know the public awareness campaigns and World Elder Abuse Awareness Day and those types of that type of work we might we would say well there's no real difference between these counties they basically are equally active so the question we're going to ask let's let, let's use APS data to think through this a little more carefully um, similarly there are differences in clients across programs, um, clients that do should not just the underlying age distribution of the community or how much poverty there is, et cetera, but who are the clients who are actually coming into the program? Are their demographics different? And also are the allegation types different? Here is another example of real data from two different fictitious counties um, in which this looks at the distribution of the types of reports that they got into their program. In one county, Two thirds of the cases were self neglect, and you know eleven point six percent were neglect. In another county, thirty four point eight percent of the cases were neglect. Now we knew from looking at the data elsewhere that you know case uh, reports of neglect were much less likely to be substantiated than cases of self neglect or of other allegations of abuse, neglect, exploitation. So if we just did an overall substantiation rate across these two counties, we might conclude that, well, well, Beehive County has a much higher substantiation rate than does Pine County. But actually, if you account for the diff dis different distribution and allegation types, maybe they're more or less the same. The same proportion of self-neglect cases are substantiated, the same proportion of exploitation cases, the same proportion of neglect cases are substantiated in each county. What's really driving the distance is just the, the types of reports they're each getting in. So it's this type of nuanced, detailed look that can really, it's really necessary in order to, for us to generate useful, accurate conclusions. 
But it gets, so I'm hoping to make you feel a little overwhelmed because it's complicated. How do we account for multiple client and community characteristics at the same time? Because after all, we have counties with different age distributions and counties with, this is in Ohio, but you can make the same application in other, the 13 other states that also have county administrative systems. And even in those states that have a statewide system, they might have different offices in different counties or different areas of the state that they're um, handling. So how do we account for both of these at the same time? Well, that's where we need kind of a competent statistician to help think through these issues. And there's ways to communicate these complicated findings in ways that can still um, make sense and are accessible to people. But that it also, um, and we did that in our study in that we tried to um, you know, look at this just in a straightforward, simple way and found that, wow, there were differences in certain characteristics. And I'll show some examples and when we talk about our results. But that, um, but that we also then did a more fancy analysis to account for these differences. And we found that the differences were still there. And so we said, you know what? We see these differences, let's say, in reporting rate. And it's not because one population's one county's population is older than the other, or it's not because one is has a higher rate of poverty, and it's not because one that they differ in terms of their distribution of um, of allegation types. We're just we we see these differences and they persist even after controlling for all of them simultaneously. And so that's where um, without getting into the weeds of this all, why it's really helpful to have a more nuanced, thoughtful approach. And unfortunately a lot of folks kind of are still dealing at the superficial level and they're not um, able to think about it in this way and that might end up limiting our ability to um, to generate really useful accurate conclusions so let me stop there take a break and ask for comments questions love to hear your thoughts and feel free to push back if this is seems off base i'd love or even just a you know a thumbs up is helpful too I was just going to say, Kenny, I think people are still digesting that one. We do not have any other questions at this point, but uh, that was a lot to absorb. So I want to give people a little bit of time to think through that and just recommend we go ahead. Oh, oh, thumbs up. You didn't get that. <laughs> but it, I just think people need to digest it a little bit more. Right. Thank no, thank you. It's, it, this is, I'm sure you've heard this from other folks. It's really hard to do these kinds of online webinars where you can't see people's faces and you have no, you don't know if I'm actually, I've actually been on mute the whole time and <laughs> no one's heard anything I've said. So thank you for the thumbs up. Um, we'll even take a thumbs down. So just wanted to review in terms of the learning objectives remember those at the beginning of the presentation just wanted to quickly provide a review so that you you uh, got what you came for one is that we talked about benefits of using APS administrative data just a couple highlights that it's the only system de primarily devoted to adult maltreatment they have many observations you can do research with little or no burden to clients or staff we can do all this maybe with generating some useful insights they're not sufficient to really understand an APS system, but they can help. And so, and they have these benefits. Um, in terms of two best practices for organizing APS data, really encourage people to, to understand the importance of cleaning data and also the effects of choosing a time window. And then lastly, in terms of identifying best practices uh, around analyzing APS data to really think through how to define metrics and how to carefully compare programs, accounting for client and community differences and, and when, when possible and when necessary using appropriate statistical models. So uh, let me, so that's where we're at now. Let me stop and, um, and we will turn over to the last section of the, uh, the webinar where we'll talk about our work in Ohio and the beautiful skyline of Columbus. So um, I want to acknowledge before we go on, Heidi's going to start us off. In addition, myself um, worked with uh, a part of our research team, also included Georgia Annetsberger and Carol Dayton. Many of you may know them from their national work with elder maltreatment and, um, and adult protective services. And also colleagues Sherry Cheney-Jones, Alyssa Petty, and Andrea Stefera. 
So uh, let me turn it over to Heidi and who can sort of talk a little bit about what were the goals initially of this project and what, what you at ODJFS, the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services, hope to understand from it. Hello. You know, one of the things that we always want to do is get a better understanding of how work is actually going um, for the folks who are on the front lines. Um, what kind of successes they're having, what kind of challenging, challenges that they're facing, um, what it is that they need from us as their major support to help them be successful. And so there were several goals that we um, set out to achieve or to uh, reach with the help of OSU and the research team. And of course, one of those first ones was how we could best use Ohio's data in our program planning, development, and implementation. And we wanted to take a look at that both from the state level and at the local level. And so utilizing the data that is out there, um, we want to know exactly, you know, or at least get some ideas of what we can do at the state level to um, plan and develop programming and how we can support our, our county agencies as they implement it. The other thing we wanted to find out, knowing that ODAPS is our not just case management system, but our data system, what the limitations of ODAPS are. How can we use it? Can it actually be used in program planning and development? Um, is it just strictly for case management or can it also be used in ways where we're managing uh, staff activity and local programming? The other thing that we were interested in looking at was how we can best provide technical assistance to counties. Um, Ohio does not have a whole lot of uh, adult protective services rules uh, as far as mandates for the counties. I think we have about 14, 16, something like that. However, there can be uh, times where there's confusion over the rules. There might be some confusion in, implement, in implementing them where it becomes very apparent from the numbers that a particular county or particular region is having some difficulty interpreting that. We also have found that there are times, especially in some of the calls that we get from our county agencies for technical assistance, that there are some differences between our rules and rules of other departments, say the Department of Aging or Mental Health or Developmental Disabilities, where we all share clients, but the rules conflict. And that feeds into what kind of um, practice that we're doing. And you can kind of pull some information uh, from your data to give you some ideas around that. And so we wanted to find out also um, how we can help our counties learn how to better use our data information system. Um, some of them love the fact that it is a case management system. They use it very well for that purpose. Their notes are in order. Their case plans are great. The assessment area, they're using it wonderfully, but they're not putting in all some of the basic data. Um, and so, you know, they're not realizing that some of the just raw statistics are very necessary. Um, but we also have found that in some of the casework that we are seeing our folks do, there's no place in uh, ODAPS for them to put the information outside of narrative sections. So we can't really count some of the information that they're putting in. So that was one of the things that we wanted to understand. And then finally, um, one of the biggest things for us is, as, as Dr. Steinman mentioned, there's 85 different APS programs across the state, 88 different counties. Some of our counties are able to pull their resources and combine and work together, and that's why we have 80, 85 programs. Um, but that's 85 different ways of doing business. So there's various program models within the state, and getting to understand how they are working in various counties. What is it about the counties that lend themselves to these particular types of models? What are the benefits of those models? What are the challenges? And so that's another reason why we wanted to undertake this. And um, as Dr. Steinman can point out to you a little later on, we got some answers to these questions and um, 
are starting to reach some of these goals. Dr. Steinman. Great, thanks, Heidi. Uh, that, that's helpful. So that sort of gives a sense about what, what um, the state was interested in doing. And we came up with a couple of different research questions that we changed and evolved throughout the course of the project that depending on uh, what was really a better question to, that we could ask and we could answer given the data that we had. And the, the three research questions around which our final report is organized um, is how do APS programs operate in Ohio? What are the different ways they operate? What can ODAPs, that is the data system, the Ohio um, Database and Adult Protective Services teach us about APS? And why do Ohio's APS programs appear to handle cases differently? So those are sort of the questions where we, we tried to answer. And there were three general approaches we used to uh, try to understand this. One is that we did a online, we did survey, because <laughs> there was some information we could really only get from the programs themselves. We couldn't tell from the, the, the data system. So we did a brief online survey asking them about the organizational characteristics of their program, the practices they use, the resources they have available. And happily, we tried to really do this well. We had 100% participation. All 85 local programs across the state participated. We're very proud of that. And, we're, and so we can really have a pretty comprehensive view of what, uh, what happened. And thanks to Leslie and Andy and others um, at WRMA and elsewhere for looking at reviewing the uh, draft of that, uh, of that survey. In terms of just to give you a flavor, and again, I in uh, and to respect the privacy and ODGFS hasn't had a chance to fully um, uh, digest this yet, so I'm I'm not putting any numbers on these graphs, but these are real data um, from this survey. We could look at just to give you an example some of the organizational characteristics of these programs. Roughly half of them were housed in what we call a CDJFS, a County Department of Job and Family Services, or just kind of a catch-all human services agency. Um, but half weren't. They might be in a senior services agency or Department of Aging or, or somewhere else. Um, roughly half, maybe a little over half, were um, had some staff mostly dedicated to APS. As I'm sure many of you are familiar, in a lot of county, a uh, lot of states where there's a county-administered program. Um, they, in practice, APS is basically involved some child protective service workers who occasionally handle APS referrals. And so, and no one person is mostly dedicated to APS. And that was the case for nearly half of the counties in Ohio, near the half of the local programs. Um, in terms of does a single staff person handle cases from intake through closing? So as you might imagine, some um, time to per, you, call, you call AP the APS number in the county and you'll pick up the summon and that same person will conduct the investigation and that same person might end up trying to re refer to uh, services, etc. Whereas other programs, they have different units. They might have a, a distinct intake unit that handles all types of initial referrals and then they might hand it off to an APS person or they might ha hand it off to a different set that for the investigation. So there are different ways, different models of doing this, and you can see that these can be combined in many different ways. Another thing we did was uh, analysis of the administrative data, which is the main focus of this, um, this webinar, and which involved for that one um, fiscal year, about roughly 20,000 reports from 15,000 unduplicated clients. And we had separate data sets on investigations and clients and alleged perpetrators and reporting parties. And we were able to link these together to get a more uh, comprehensive view of different uh, cases. And again, they, we distinguish them by the 80, across the 85 different programs for one year. And Ohio is uh, unusual in that it's only re required to, uh, for APS to handle clients who are 60 years or older. Um, a couple counties handle younger clients as well, but there was only a few hundred of those and it was, you know, many counties didn't do any at all. And so we decided to omit those from our analysis and just focus on the 60 and over. This gives, this slide gives an example of the variation in the reporting rate, if you will, just the total number of unduplicated clients per 1,000 residents 60 years and over in 76 of the 85 programs. And, and some of the counties, there were just too few cases to calculate a reliable rate. 
And so we decided, but you can see tremendous variation. Again, there's no numbers here, but trust me, it's, it's large. And for anyone who has ever uh, heard from uh, Carl Urban or some of his colleagues at WRMA presenting results from the National Maltreatment, uh, Adult Maltreatment Reporting System, NAMERS, um, they found similar variation uh, from state to state. Um, this is different in that, um, in that all of these counties purportedly work under the same legal system. They might have some variation from county to county in terms of how they handle it, but that uh, this is not um, widely defined, widely varying definitions of what constitutes APS. So there's some, and yet, yet we still see tremendous variation. And one of the challenges for namers is that all, despite all of this variation, they report, Ohio reports just one number to namers. So that, that supposedly represents the entire state. So I'm sorry, let me uh, go. Also, we, com we were able to combine the uh, namers data with the, uh, I'm sorry, not the namers data, the ODAPS data with the uh, survey data and began to see like how some of these characteristics of programs or the resources they had available might be associated with certain um, uh, metrics in ODAPS. So for instance, we had asked people on the survey whether how often they uh, had an opportunity to share complex cases with an I team. And for counties that said that they often or always did, they actually had a higher percentage of allegations that were validated. They also had a higher percentage of cases that were initiated within one day. And they had a lower percentage of cases that were closed because of client refusal. Now we all know that like in print, uh, many of us, I don't know all, but uh, it's, it's many people appreciate the value of I teams and how, or, and, or multidisciplinary teams. Um, and, and yet here's some hard evidence that suggests that those counties that have them actually might be uh, on these particular metrics might you know, be different than counties that don't have this. And again, we're not ready necessarily to pass judgment. They are quote unquote better but that certainly um, we're excited to share this information with the local uh, programs to find out what they take, whether this aligns with their experience or, or if it doesn't. So um, lastly, as I mentioned before, we found these, these types of differences, but then also we did more uh, fancier analyses using generalized estimating equations and other multivariable models I won't get into that will, um, that found that even after we account for client and community differences, we still saw these, these differences for I-teams and for um, other aspects of the program I won't get into in the interest of time. So we're very excited that these are real findings that are not, we don't think are that easy to dismiss. And so we think it's worth taking them to local practitioners and to policymakers and to agency directors and saying, this is something we think is worthy of your attention. We don't think this is just something we can dismiss because the data are um, you know, wildly inaccurate or missing. We really were careful in attending to it and we think it's worth uh, moving forward with them. So what do you think? And together we might be able to use these to eventually together decide on if there are there metrics we can use to improve our performance, to improve the, uh, ensure the quality of the work that APS is doing in Ohio. Um, the last piece of what we did, in addition to the survey and in addition to the uh, analysis of ODAPS, is we thought it was really important to actually, um, in the age of COVID, conduct a virtual site visit for six diverse types of programs, um, some rural, some urban, um, but all of which had something noteworthy about them. So one, for instance, was one of those few um, multi-county systems in a rural area where a couple of rural counties had gotten together and to hear from them about their, uh, their experience of how that worked. Um, others of them were, let's say it was a small rural county, but it had somebody who was um, solely dedicated to, or mostly dedicated to APS. Others were an urban county with a particularly strong I team. Or another one was a suburban county that had closely integrated their APS and their child protective service work and, and really tried to treat them both on equal footing. So some things that were different in different ways and they were all, and, and all of which had um, what we thought were you know, promising metrics. Again, we weren't passing judgment yet, but we wanted to try to understand a little bit a bit about why the different ways in which success might be achieved. 
And we did an on uh, hour long group interview and then we summarized these in a two page write up um, that we're putting together collating in a into a document to just highlight a couple different um, programs across the state that and what for them worked well what challenges were they facing and and to be able to use some of their verbatim quotes to help ground some of the numbers we're saying and saying that we're actually listening to um, frontline workers from the beginning. So let me stop there and say, so that's kind of what we did and some of the things we learned and I'd love to kind of turn it back over to Heidi where she can sort of summarize what, what her takeaways and what her agency's takeaways were from this project. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't on mute anymore. Um, you know, we learned a lot, but we also found a lot of things that we kind of expected you know how you, you you pretty much know what you're going to find but you want to dig deeper and so even though we found that a lot of the things that we thought were true were true there were some things that we found that um, were a little bit different than we were anticipating them to be or they were much more useful than we thought they would be and one of the things that we did learn was how different program models can be replicated in like counties. Even though we, you know, know that we have these 85 different ways of doing business, we have counties that have a lot of similarities. And so one of the things that we found out is that if a particular agency is using something that is working well for them, a different practice, uh, you know, what is best practice for them. It could also be best practice for the next door county or the county on the other side of the state that has a similar um, socioeconomic uh, demographic or a political uh, demographic than that county. And so they can share ideas and they can uh, learn from each other about different program models that will work. So that is one of the things that we wanted to see if it would pan out and it did. Um, the other thing that we learned is you can't just pull the, the numbers as, as Dr. Steinman has said several times, just looking at the raw data is not going to get you what you need. You need to really drill down. You need to look at it in context. And so one of the things we learned from this is how to put data in the context of real time practice. So, you know, in order to have the data have meaning, the work that was done with the SOAPs, the uh, survey, and the interviews all were put together to try to get an idea of what this data means on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, how it came about that certain things happen the way that they do. The other thing that we learned is that a data system can help with management and planning at the state and local level. Um, one of the things that we are finding out, especially now with the influx of uh, money that's coming from the federal government, the uh, COVID-19 grants, and now the money that's coming from ARPA, we are excited in that we have some ideas of what is going on in the counties and in our state as a whole because of this study, and that will help us to target better how to utilize that money. It also helps us to provide some assistance better uh, to the counties knowing what they're facing. And when they ask us questions, how can we use this money? Is this an appropriate use of funds? This is a real need that we have. Then we can talk about it better. One of the biggest things though for me that we got out of this is that we now know better how to ask the questions that we really want to answer. Um, we don't want to be the guy that's drifting around in the balloon trying to get somewhere with the young lady on the ground not really telling us what we need to know. Um, we need to ask the right question so that we can get the right answer or at least an answer that will put us on the right path. So that's one of the things that we learned from uh, working with OSU on this. We've also learned about new ways to dialogue with our counties about best practices. I was speaking with uh, the research team earlier and we talked about the fact that so many times, especially in a county, admin, uh, county administered state, the counties look at the situation as a us versus them kind of a thing. Them being the, uh, the state, 
that's those people they're at the state they're different than us they think they're the boss you know this and that and so when we try to talk to them and establish discourse and, and have a good conversation they are sometimes apprehensive um, about talking to us uh, for various reasons or all they really want to talk about is funding because that is an actual uh, that's a reality for them um, but working with OSU and having them approach the counties and establish a dialogue and, and talk with them and finding out what's going on and what practices are working and what practices aren't, that has been a really big help. And that's helping us as we start to move forward in enhancing and strengthening our communications with our counties along the lines of best practices and uh, program models. But that also leads us into uh, developing and creating outcome measures and indicators that will help us to ensure some quality assurance and quality uh, practice improvement, program improvement as we go along. So one of the things that we did, we were in the, currently before the OSU research really started, we had started a dialogue with the counties um, starting to work towards a quality assurance, technical assurance process. And we approached the counties with the idea that we want to be of assistance to you, but we need you to guide us in that. We would like for you to tell us what it is you would like for us to assist you with, the types of issues you'd like for us to address, how can we best help you? By asking the counties what they really needed from us gave us an opportunity to start talking, not so much about are they in compliance with the rules and the regs, but what their needs actually are in being compliant to help them to become compliant and to find out what best practice is. The information that we have um, gained from this particular study and um, the interviews that uh, Dr. Steinman and his team did is helping to really fuel even more that conversation and put us even more on the path towards developing uh, a system where we can be a better uh, help to counties in doing quality practice. So those are some of the things that we have learned um, in a nutshell, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Steinman. Thank you, Heidi. And so just um, to a couple quick um, uh, points and summaries that we, we really found that there are different paths to success and we want to recognize that and not try to um, force counties to um, necessarily adopt a certain single model that we think is successful, but rather recognize the different approaches they might take and that those have evolved as a result of their you know the local politics and the local resources they might have or might more or might lack and so that said we also don't want to avoid the the um talking about some of the things that we um that we found in the study and so some of the char characteristics that do matter and so by using best practices to organize and analyze the data we try we're we tried to come up with some what we think are clear results. And right now, in terms of our next steps, starting in July, we're going to start presenting the actual results to the different agencies in a series of online webinars that uh, and part of the typical regional training sessions that, that the counties work at and also at a, a statewide meeting in August and then perhaps NAPSA. But we're really eager to share what we think we've found, but then also really listen and say, what do you think? And recognize that the long-term success of this whole project will depend on the local practitioner's willingness to work with the state um, to help understand these data in greater detail. And for the state to be able to perhaps, perhaps tailor their technical assistance to different counties depending on what they need. And now they can use the report that we've generated to say, oh, this particular county, huh, this seemed to be some of the things that we found from you um, when we looked at it and, and use that as a basis for, um, for discussion. So we're very excited about the potential for this in Ohio, but also perhaps even nationally. And that's why we're, we're so appreciative of Leslie and Andy and WRMA of giving us a chance to speak with other states and hear from, and I'd love to hear from you all about whether, what of this resonates with you, 
and whether there's any um, things that you think we might have missed and that we could uh, do better moving forward in, in communicating these results to our local workforce. So let me stop there. Okay, well, you actually answered the questions I personally had about when the information was going to be available and, and disseminated. So thanks for covering that. Um, in addition, we do have a couple of questions that I want to put forward. The first one is, should APS programs require data fields in an attempt to mitigate missing data? Mm -hmm. And again, should APS programs require data fields in an attempt to mitigate missing data? I have my take on um, what Heidi, what you think? Okay, uh, I'm I'm going to to kind of speak to it from uh, where we sit at the state level, and the answer to that would be yes. There are certain data fields that we have to have, and when we set up um, our particular system, we set it so that certain things had to be entered, or you couldn't move forward. Um, we also, though, set it so that if there is a field that's not necessarily required and you don't have the information for it, you can come back later and add it as well. But as we go along, we're also finding out that there are other fields that we just kind of took for granted that people would fill out, say race, ethnicity, or what have you, uh, gender. Um, folks didn't always fill that out. And so we've had to go back and make some more fields required. Um, so it is difficult, though, when you're doing intake to get all of that information. And so if you, if you don't make it, say, required up front, it needs to be so that you can go back and get it and it become part of your information before a case is closed. Dr. Steinman, your, your thoughts? I, I mean, I agree. The only thing I might add is just to be, to recognize that filling out data is not a lot of fun and they feel and most many frontline workers never see the results of it so they fill out this paperwork and they're busy doing a thousand and one other things and so to be very cautious about requiring fields recognizing it could impede their ability to do their work well so my, my, my shorter answer would be to say yes it's okay to require certain fields but be careful what you require and it, it should be for a very good reason, and that reason should be coming out of a dialogue between researchers and practitioners. Okay, thank you. And then the last question that we have, so far anyway, um, are there any studies that address seasonal variation in APS reports? Again, are there any studies that address seasonal variation in APS reports? To my knowledge, no, um, is the short answer. The slightly longer answer is that, that those do not, uh, I've seen individual states reports and some of them do have, uh, have some um, a seasonal variation described as part of that. We certainly found it here. It'd be interesting to see if there were similarities from state to state. I do know that a recent study from South Carolina um, tracked changes in, in trends over a couple of years. Um, and I think, I, I don't remember off the top of my head whether they looked at seasonal variation within each year, but that um, I'm, if, I'm, I'd be happy to follow up on that. It was Soto Ramirez, I remember, was the first author and it was published last year in 2020. I'm using data from South Carolina. So that's the only thing I can think of, but that's a real limitation. It shows how little we know and how important it would be to be able to share this type of work and, and, uh, and um, so we can learn from one another. Okay, well, that is all that we have. And so if you go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, so this is the contact information for the APS TARC. Feel free to reach out to us. As uh, Dr. Steinman said earlier, his contact information is on his slide um, earlier in the presentation. But if uh, you don't want to go there, you can always just email us at the APS TARC and we can connect you with him. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to be able to send the slides out. It's been brought to my attention. We are going to be able to send the slides out to all attendees following the presentation, so you should get a copy of the handout this afternoon. 
And with that, I'm going to give you back an extra 10 minutes of your afternoon and thank everyone for attending. And a special thank you to Dr. Steinman and Heidi Turner Stone for their presentation and their time. We much appreciated it and it was good information. Great. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Yes, everyone have a good afternoon. Thank I'm you. sorry, Kenny. Bye -bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.